Thank you to our worship team. I think on an average, probably, they're the oldest worship team in the community. But they're young at heart. And, uh, yeah, new at heart. <laughs> hey, on the back of your bulletin, I want you to notice, uh, I have posted there a note about, through the Bible radio program, that's Dr. J. Vernon McGee. How many have heard of him? Oh, yeah. yeah, and you may listen to this program. If not, I encourage you to do so. It will take you through the Bible in five years. You say, well, that's a long time. We had a lady from uh, Sparta, Mrs. Rogers, went to the nursing home. She was 90-something, and she had the sixth volume commentary of Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And she said, I'm going to read this through. I thought, that's a pretty good goal at 95 or whatever she was. But she did. She read it all the way through. And uh, you want to create in your life a Christian university. And this is one way to do that. So at some point in your daily time, you'll read or hear Dr. McGee, and you can trust him. He'll just tell you the truth. Uh, he says, where the rubber meets the road. Or you could hear him on BBN. That's the Bible Broadcast Network. That's 102.9, old at WFUR. How many listen to that program? WFUR, 102.9. You leave that out all day, you'll hear some good music and some good teaching and preaching. It'll bless you. I mean, Dr. Rogers is on that. Uh, Davies is on that. Uh, Dr. Hudson. Is, a lot of good fellows that are preaching the word there. And there's Elizabeth Elliott and some others, too, that you could listen to. So that note, I want to uh, give you some references as we go along that uh, I utilize. It's been a blessing to me, and I want you to know what they are. Um, so, okay, today we're in Luke chapter 7. Uh, this is our communion Sunday, and I'm so happy for the theme song, Grace, Grace, Marvelous Grace, Grace that Exceeds Our Sin. You cannot out-sin God's grace. Just get that firm in your mind. So the title of our message today is The Gospel of Grace. Can it really be that good? It's better than what you think. So I would have a subtitle to this, Surprising Sermon at a Supper. Four life-changing words. I forgot my PowerPoint USB to home and had to quickly run one together on the church's computer back there. So uh, I generally like to put all the references, I like to print out the Bible scripture so you don't have to turn. But today we're going to have to do it in the old way. Let your fingers do the walking. You can find the scriptures and read them right out of your own Bible as we proceed today. So can four words change your life? Father, thank you. Yes. Our lives can be changed in eternal, eternal future if we comprehend and receive the wonderful gospel of grace that you've given. So open the word to our hearts and minds and help us to today respond to your gracious invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Can four words really change your life? Well... If you're a young woman with a boyfriend and he says, will you marry me? That's four life-changing words. <laughs> or later on, if you get married and you have a baby, or, you, you know, when she goes to the doctor and he says, yes, you are pregnant. <laughs> That's life-changing. And from there on, your whole universe is revolving around a whole different center. Now, four words. You go to the doctor and he says, <clears throat> Yes, it's cancer. I'm sorry, it's cancer. That's life-changing. Life-changing words. Or you get a letter from the IRS, uh, your tax is audited. That's like a financial colonoscopy. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> that's a terrible thing to worry about. So uh, you could probably add four words that really are life-changing. I'm saying we're going to study four words, but the four words that were absolutely life-changing. Changing. This is a true story. Four words that changed a woman's life. It was in the newspaper, reported by the Medical News Today. For years, or for years back, I say, a few years back, a woman was trans-Atlantic airplane flight going from England to Florida. And uh, 
she called the attendant. She says, I think I'm having a heart attack. So the attendant got on the announcing the PA and says, are there any doctors here? Sixteen people stood up. She said, are any of you heart specialists? Sixteen people stayed on their feet. They were all headed for a cardiac uh, specialist seminar in Florida. <laughs> and there they were. And they were, they said, yes, we'll, we'll help you. Can you imagine how wonderful that news was to that woman? That there were people there that were ready and able to help her. Well, I'm going to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is able to help you and you need help. And he's able and ready and he's going to offer you this, this opportunity. So we're going to celebrate communion today. Because individually, we have received these four life-changing words. We are not taking communion in order to get something. We're celebrating that we have something. Amen. Amen? So our text today, Jesus changed lives with just four words. We're in chapter 7. I want to talk about the incident first. And I... I want to thank the Lord for our folks who assist me back there because they have uh, the responsibility to listen where I am and try to keep up. And that's pretty difficult when I don't know where I'm going myself sometimes. <laughs> so here we have two individuals, and they have, uh, they're at the opposite end of the social strata, and uh, they are representative of us, each of us today. That's verse 36 through 39. I'm not going to read it. But there are two individuals in the story. There's Simon, the Pharisee, and there's the woman who probably was a prostitute. Simon, Pharisee, the woman was a prostitute. I'm saying that we are all, each of us, in this story. Which are you? I mean, your sin may be different than her sin, but are you the Pharisee, or are you the one who recognizes that you have a sin problem? So back in those days, I want to quickly cover this, uh, women were not invited to eat a meal, especially not at a Jewish scribe or a priest or a Pharisee's house. Certainly not a woman of this reputation would have never been invited to the table. Uh, the sin she is involved in, and it's really not specifically named, but it likely was that she was a woman with a bad reputation from the red light district. And probably she was well known to some of the fellows that were in that meeting, that gathering. But she knew she was a sinner. She knew that. Had a conviction and a desperate need. And she humbly and contritely bows before the Lord and uh, approaches Jesus in spite of the fact that she was a sinner. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the Lord God. None of us can walk into the presence of Lord Jesus Christ proudly or arrogantly. Your sin may be different than her sin, but you realize every character in the Bible was a sinner until they came to Christ, until they came to God. Did you realize that most of the Bible is written by murderers? Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer. Paul was a murderer. Do you have sin that's worse than the sin that's recorded in the Bible by all of these people? Adultery, thieves, murders, robbers? No, we're all sinners. We may sin differently, but we all sin. So it's amazing here that she took the most valuable, precious thing that she had, that which she used to, to use to attract men, she uses to anoint Jesus, that valuable perfume. Isn't that amazing? How God takes what we were and turns it into something that can bring glory to Him. So her hair used to draw men to herself, and now she uses it to dry the Lord's feet. That's the first individual. The second individual, Simon, he was a wealthy Pharisee. And uh, the homes of the wealthy were very palatial. 
and they had a courtyard that surrounded the house and oftentimes when they had a special guest, especially if it was a speaker of some sort, they would let the community gather around outside and over here. But this time, the outsider went right inside to the table. So the Lord gives us an illustration in verse 39. I give an illustration, it goes 39 to verse 47, and then he asks a question. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, where the lady was bowing at his feet and he was administering to her, the Pharisee said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is that's touching him, that she is a sinner. Well, Simon was a sinner too with a great knee, but his sin was hidden. Her sin was public. And he could aim his finger and say, she is a sinner. But it was impossible for him to say four words, I am a sinner. She is a sinner. Don't get in the blame game. Because the finger you're pointing out points three fingers back at yourself. She, he considered himself better than that woman. And he didn't sense any need for forgiveness in his own life. He was a good moral person, a good religious person. He had a ten, perfect attendance at the synagogue. He'd been raised in Salat school. And so he was really something. So the question again, which one do you identify with? The accused? or the accuser. Listen, we can't do anything about somebody else's sin. So you need to stop worrying about other people and make sure that yourself is right before God. So the question, which person are you? You're in one category or the other. Look at the beginning of Jesus' words in verse 48. Your sins are forgiven. Wow! Your sins are forgiven. I want you to notice that he doesn't talk about the type of sin. He doesn't talk about the amount of sin. He talks about the fact that her sins, which are many, verse 7, your sins are forgiven. It's not the amount of your sins, it's the awareness. You can't out -sin God's grace. Number them up. How many sins have you committed in your life? Millions, billions? You can't out sin God's grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord's sin. A grace that exceeds our sin and our gift. That is good news. The gospel is better than what you thought. And if we get this word outside of the community, they'll be glad. Some will be glad to hear this. So how much sin, what kind of sin, must a sinner commit? To be a sinner. How many sins, don't raise your hand, don't answer. How many sins do you have to commit to be a sinner? Don't answer that, because the answer is zero. You were born in sin. You were born in a sinful world to sinful parents. You were born in sin, the Bible tells us. We're all sinners, without hope, without help, apart from the grace of God. So Simon and the woman were both sinners. Different sins. His sins were hidden. His were sins of the pride. Hers were more exposed. Sins of the flesh. The point is, both of them were spiritually bankrupt. Neither of them could pay. That's what that whole illustration is about. Neither of them could pay what they had to pay. So there we are. We're all sinners. Each one of us, spiritual bankrupt, unable to pay the debt to God, all in a desperate need right now at this minute. We are in the presence of the one who can take care of our sin, who did take care of our sin debt, and is able to forgive us. Hallelujah. Wow. So he canceled the debt. Colossians 2.13 I have it written down, so I'm going to read it to you. But you can flip to it and hold your place because we'll be back there. He canceled the debt. 
He says in Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that just means you're a sinner, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all transgressions. Do you believe that? That God has forgiven you of all your transgressions? Not only forgiven you, but he's also set you free from any legal obligation, any works-based religion. Verse 13, 14 says, having wiped, uh, wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, that's the Old Testament law, illegal, which was contrary to us, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Where did Jesus' forgiveness pay the sin debt? At the cross. Where did Jesus fulfill and end the law for those who believe? At the cross. He nailed it to the cross. So I want you to listen to this incredible pronouncement that Jesus makes. You see, Simon, in all the Jewish world at that point, were under the law. Sins were never forgiven. They had the Day of Atonement once a year where they came together to remember their sins and go to the sacrifice that covered their sins, but it didn't take away their sins. The Day of Atonement was a time to remember your sin. Communion is not for that purpose. Communion is to remember the Savior and what He did, and that's why we call it a celebration. I can't tell you how my heart grieves as I go to churches and we come to communion and they turn down the lights and play spooky music and try to get you to have a tear to get ready to take communion to try to finish what Christ already finished at Calvary. That is not the purpose of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is to celebrate. It is finished. Amen. Hallelujah. So this is an incredible announcement. Your sins are forgiven. Four short words that will change your life. Number one is the word that's personal. Your. Personal. Your. He's speaking directly. It's in the grammar. It's a second person pronoun in the nominative objective case. Doesn't that bless your gizzard to hear that? <laughs> What he's saying is personal. It's not only to her, it's not only historical, it's present. Your, my. He's speaking to me through his word. It's to her in the word, but it's to me by the spirit in my life. Your. Hallelujah. Chuck, your. Now, what's the point? Well, it's personal. This is not some cold, impersonal passage of Scripture we look at and say, and say, well, that was a nice study. He's not talking about somebody else. He's talking to you if you receive it. You are. Did you come with from a load of sin? Listen to the Lord speak to you. Your sin. Your sin. Now notice again, it was the Pharisee that was looking at somebody else. Let's not be like that. We can't do anything about somebody else. We can do something about ourselves. So the first word is a personal. The second word is it's a problem. Your sin. That is not politically correct. That's really not nice to talk about sin. In fact, if we start to name sin, sin, it will be hate speech. And in Canada, they already put preachers in jail because they name sin, sin. But uh, here it is, your sin. She had been a, a loose woman, probably a prostitute. And uh, the world today can call it whatever they want. They can call it hooking up or shacking up or living together, trial marriage, call it whatever you want. Jesus calls it what it is, sin. He said it. If you get upset with me, you got to aim higher than me because this is what the Lord says. He, he looked at her and said, your sin has been forgiven. Your sin. So it's a problem, sin. The personal word, yours, it's a problem word, sins. It's a word that's present tense. Are. 
Hallelujah. What a relief. Right then, right now, your sins are forgiven. Is that something to celebrate? It's not probationary. It's not a probationary period in this life. And it's not purgatory in the next. It is immediately yes or no today, in this day, in this world, in this point, in this manner. It's personal. So you fill in the blanks. Your sins are what? Your sins are obvious, your sins are hidden, your sins are obscure, your sins are keeping you up at night, your sins are destroying your life, your sins are destroying other people's lives. <sighs> your sins, are they plaguing you? So it's a problem, it's a pardon, for number four. It's a pardon, it's a word, it's a pardon. When we celebrate communion, you are surrounded with people who are forgiven sinners. They're just sinners. But by God's grace, they are forgiven. Taking communion, not to be forgiven. Because they have been forgiven. Salvation is not in the communion cup. It's not in the grape juice. It's in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not the communion, it's the cross. The, the salvation takes place. When we serve these elements, there's nothing causative. They're not going to cause anything. They are a remembrance. They're commemorative. They're representing something. So, I want you to notice verse 47. I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven. And may I say it, he knew all of her sins. And he knew all of your sins when he went to the cross also. Nothing you have ever done has taken Jesus Christ by surprise. Then it says in Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did he take care of all of our sins? Christ died. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses you from all sin. So how many of our sins were forgiven? How many of your sins are forgiven? Wow, what a wonderful truth that is. Ephesians 1, 7. And in him we have redemption. How? Through the blood. Through his blood, we have forgiveness of our trespasses or our sins according to the riches of his grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. So you need to hear this. It's not the amount of your sin. It's not the size of your sin. It's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that he removes your sin. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. So verse 47 in our text, her sins which are many have been forgiven. Notice this. Not just the sins she confessed. Not just the sins she remembered. You see, because some people have a misunderstanding about this matter of confession. It's not your confession. How many sins did you remember to confess? How many sins did you commit? You say, oh, well, that doesn't make any difference. Those that I've forgotten about. Well, then you ought to pray for amnesia. <laughs> no, Christ took care of all your sins, not just those you remember. <clears throat> That's something to celebrate. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Once you're in Christ. See, there's, there are no 60% forgiven Christians. No 35% forgiving Christians. You are either in Adam, 100% sinner, or you're in Christ, 100% saved. I get excited about that. Hallelujah. Did you receive Christ? When you received Christ, the Holy Spirit took you out of Adam, put you in Christ. Are you forgiven? How are you forgiven? Because you're in Christ. Amen. I don't know why you're not excited. I'm excited. <laughs> so, the gospel of grace is better 
than what we tell people. Second thing is, how long will they forgive it? Listen to God's word, Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to, toward their iniquities or sin. I will remember their sins no more. Wow. Don't keep reminding him of what he's already forgotten. What he's already forgiven. How many Christians we have to deal with that just can't get over the fact that back there they did something they think is too great to be forgiven? Wow. Listen, it doesn't make any difference what my opinion is or what your opinion is. It's what God says. When he says, I will remember your sin no more, that's an exclamation. It's not a question mark. It's not a debate. It's not a discussion. It is a disclosure. God says it. Amen. So, Hebrews 10, 17, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Ha! Hallelujah. Gone, 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 gone. Remember singing that? Yes, yes my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart so so buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally. Why am I going to live eternally? Because I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. He ever lives to make intercession for me. If I fail, he's, fa he, he's not failed. He won't fail. He's faithful. Hallelujah. So it's a word of pardon or forgiveness, which actually means, actually forgiveness is greater than pardon. Colossians 1.14 says that in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of of sins. That means he takes it away. Expiation. Propitiation. Christ satisfied completely God about sin. Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Even better than that, because you can think, and some people can think, well, if I, or if I, if, you know, whenever people are insecure, I know one thing. They've stopped looking at the Savior. They've stopped looking at themselves. You are always going to get disappointed if you look at yourself. But what if I? What if I? Okay, Romans 4, 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He not only took away all the sin, he says, I'm going to take care of the sin that you're going to do tomorrow. I'm not going to count it down. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Is the blood of Jesus Christ powerful? I want to tell you, amen. Hallelujah. You act like you've never heard this before. You look at it just like, wow. But what a word this matter of forgiveness it means. We've been redeemed. We've been the sin that's paid, taken care of. We've been reconciled. We're in Christ. Verse 48 says, your sins, plural, have been forgiven. What's the basis? Did God just love her? Does God just love us? And so like a grandfather, he says, that's okay. You can come in. It'll be all right. I just let you. No, listen to me. God's love doesn't save anybody. His love motivated him to pay the debt. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Hallelujah. What part in that verse did you have to do with? God so loved the world that he gave his own... He didn't ask for a, a, a vote. He didn't ask for permission. He initiated the way of salvation. He gave. He paid the price by his precious son. What's our part? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our part is to respond. Salvation cannot be achieved, but it can be received. He paid the debt for the world's sin. Does that mean everybody's saved? No. Why? They need to be reconciled. They need to receive God's gift. This is the basis. Colossians 1.14 says that in Christ we have redemption through his blood. Sometimes you hear a person say, have you made peace with God? That's the wrong question. Nobody can make peace with God. God already made peace to the cross. He's made the only way of peace. It's Jesus Christ who paid the debt for you at Calvary. Colossians 1.20, having made peace to the blood of his cross. It's at the cross. So, it's paid. 
On the YouTube, there is one that's called uh, Pay Forward. And two fellows decided they'd go to the grocery store and pay the, the bill forward for the next person in line. And they did that for a few times. And people, when they were told it's already paid for, they said, well, wow, thank you. What a wonderful gift. But one lady, when the clerk says it's already been paid, she tried to swipe her credit card again. And the clerk said, no, it's already paid for. She tried to swipe her credit, credit card again. I said to myself, what a representation of Christians. Mm -hmm. He's already paid it. We keep trying to pay it. So if you have the wrong emphasis on communion, and the emblems are being passed, there you are, trying to dredge up something, and then feeling sincerely sorry and trying to beg enough and say enough words and ask God to, to pardon you. you got to hurry up and get it done before the communion cup comes to you. See, what is wrong with that? We are trying to pay for what he already paid for. We do not understand the meaning of that cup. We're not doing this in order to get saved. It's because he's already saved it. It's a celebration. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, um, it's already paid for. I'm just saying, the gospel is so good. I want to just bear down a bit on, on what basis can we have this. Because when I talk this way, some people say, well, you're, you're quite presumptuous. Well, let's let the word of God speak then. Colossians 1.20, by him, that is, by Jesus Christ, God reconciled all things to himself. By him, were the things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Back to our lady on the plain. Um, it wouldn't have done her any good if she had heard all 16 of those people say, we will help you. If she didn't let him help her. It would do nobody any good to hear Jesus paid it all. All to him. Unless you receive what he did for you. As many as received him. All you can do. The work of God is to believe on him. If she had said, well, this heart attack is not so bad, I can, I can outlast this, I can deal with this later. No, she would not have been saved. There are people who hear the gospel message like this, and they'll say, well, this is too good. I can't believe it's that easy. It has to be easier. We wouldn't be able to receive it. We wouldn't be able to get to it. It has to be easy. So I want you to notice what he says in verse 50. And he said to the woman, your faith, your response has saved you. Go in peace. Well, it really wasn't her faith. It was the object of her faith. Her faith was the channel. God does not force salvation on people. He gives a gracious invitation. Whosoever will may come. Today, you can come. There was no room for her at the Pharisee's table. There was room for her at the Lord's table because of his grace. There's room for you at the Lord's table. Communion is a celebration. Amen. It's like a birthday party. <laughs> Eating the cake doesn't make you warm. You eat the cake because you was born. Tony Campolo was a great evangelist. He's gone now, but... Uh, he one time flew from Philadelphia to Honolulu for some meetings, and he was in a jet lag and up in the middle of the morning, can't sleep, and so he wandered in the street to about 3 o'clock in the morning. He found a greasy spoon, went in to get a donut and a cup of coffee. About 3.30, all the ladies of the night started showing up at that spot. Pretty soon there's about a dozen prostitutes surrounding him. Here's the reverend with all those prostitutes. What's he going to do? Well, over here is the one younger one, probably 29 or so, and she says, tomorrow's my birthday. One of the older ones 
jaded and sarcastic and said, well, what do you want me to do about that? I suppose we're going to have a birthday party for you? And the other one, the younger one, said, well, no, I've never had a birthday party. I don't, you don't have to be so mean. I don't expect anybody to give me a birthday party. The preacher got thinking, you know what? And so he went and talked to the chef, the owner, the waiter, the bartender, the, the guy, the one guy operation. He says, how about if we have a birthday party for her tomorrow? And the chef said, well, you know, that'd be nice. He said, I'll make a cake. And then Tony says, I'll decorate the, the diner. And he told the lady secretly to get out the word. We're going to have a birthday party for Agnes tomorrow. Well, they were all excited about it. The next day, about 3.30 in the morning, there he is in the diner, and all the prostitutes in Honolulu would seem to kind of uh, joined into that place with him. They were sort of hidden in the back room. When Agnes came in, they ran out and said, Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! And she was so moved. And they say, happy birthday. She had tears. And the chef cake and cut it and gave her the knife to cut it. And she was just so beside herself. She couldn't believe this. And it was kind of quiet at that moment. And uh, Tony Campolo said, let's pray. And so they all quieted down. And he prayed and asked the Lord to bless Agnes was her name. And uh, help her to understand the way of salvation. Give her a future. Help her to have some pop up opportunities to have a different lifestyle. And when he got down and said, Amen, the, preacher, the uh, chef looked at him and said, I didn't know you were a preacher. What kind of church do you come from? And Tony said, I, I go to church that throws a party for a prostitute at 3 o'clock in the morning. Amen. If we're that kind of church, we'll have a vibrant message for this community. If we preach and teach and talk to them about how good the grace of God is, I mean the grace of God, all the religions, the religions of the world and churches in general teach a way that you can do things to get right with God. That is not the gospel. The gospel is what God has done for you. And all you need to do is receive it. Hallelujah. That's what we celebrate in communion. So I want to ask you, how about your sins? Are they plaguing you? Or have you received the pardon that Jesus Christ offers through his shed blood? Thank you, Father, for your word. What a wonderful <coughs> message. Good news of the gospel. Help us not only to appreciate it, receive it, and enjoy it, but to share it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we'll have the fellows come and pass the elements. I think, uh, Pastor Paul, can you do get up there? Oh, we got two of those. Okay, come on, <coughs> fellas. You know what to do. We have not had that many communion times together, so it's not the routine that we are depending upon. Go ahead and grab the elements and start passing them. It's not a certain routine. It's not a formal thing. This is not a formal thing. Remember, they were just sitting together at the end of the pass of the real world said, yeah, I'm going to do something new. And he gave the elements. And what did he say? What is the purpose? Don't forget the purpose of this. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. Not in remembrance of you, your behavior, your failures. It's a remember of what he did. <clears throat> That's a celebration. So it's not a ritual. It's the reality of what Christ has done in our hearts and lives. That's why I can hardly keep from saying, praise the Lord. Or hallelujah. Whenever I think you're supposed to be quiet, I'm getting excited. There's joy buds in my soul. Think what God has done. You see, if you've been forgiven much, you can't hold it back. You love much. I've been a sinner. God knows. Hallelujah. He's taken all the way. That's something to celebrate. Now I think that we have these, this is 
not how they did it originally, you know, they just had a cup and a loaf of bread that was easy, but we got to go through this because of uh, our concerns about infection. So if you turn up to the little wafer and you peel that top off and then take this, and the Lord said, this is a symbol, this is an emblem, this is a memorial. This is like my body, which is broken for you. Do this and remember, not of all your failures, but in what I did at the cross, it is finished. Hallelujah. Well, preacher, what if you do remember a failure, a bad choice? Okay. It's always good to agree with God on what it is. Just say, Lord, forgive me. For not going to. Lord, I, I recognize that was a wrong choice. That was a failure. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses me. Teach me. May I have the wisdom of God to avoid that situation in the future. Yeah, it's always good to do that. But you see, it doesn't take communion service to do that. You can do that driving down the street any day of the week, any time. Don't wait to communion to try to make short accounts with God. So then we turn it over and the other side, isn't that unique, is the cup. I say this, I'm telling you this because my wife and I went to one church and they did this and we didn't know how in the world to get into the thing. So there might be somebody here who doesn't know how. And so the other side is, there's a little bitty bit of grape juice. Just a little bit of grape juice. It's just an emblem, okay? But it represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing more powerful in the world than the blood of Jesus Christ. It'll blow the sin right out of your life. It'll blow you from hell to heaven. If you understand, it's the blood of Christ on the cross, not the cup. This is just a remembrance of him. This do a remembrance of me. Amen. My sins are gone. Hallelujah. Paul, are we going to sing a song? Okay. I'll ask our young worship team to come and lead us in the song. <laughs>